the screen. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the title of my talk is Biodiversity, but we all know the important part of that biodiversity. I think in this crowd, maybe it's safe to just focus in on the extraordinary plant diversity of California and the endemic diversity that, of course, Eddie was referring to spectacular uh, map of the nation and the way that the Bay Area jumps out. And if any of you, if you look at this, you know, little um, array of plants here, one thing you'll all know right away as you scan it is that, of course, these plants are not plants that all live in the same place. They don't live under the same climate. They are adapted to a wide range of different conditions and an extraordinary amount of the diversity that we have in California is really tied to how unique our climate is. Now here there's three maps, the winter temperature, the summer temperature, and the precipitation. What this doesn't show, of course, is our Mediterranean climate with the precipitation coming uh, in winter and dry in summer, which makes us so unusual relative to the rest of the country and certainly has driven the evolution of a lot of <laughs> unique adaptations and unique plants in the, in the bioregion. But the other thing, and I certainly don't need to tell this audience, one of the things that makes California so extraordinary, of course, we have latitudinal gradients. It's cooler in the north, hotter in the south. We have elevational gradients, cooler in the high mountains of the Sierra and wetter and uh, warmer in the lowlands. But we also have this extraordinary maritime climate uh, driven by the cool Pacific Ocean, where the, the co near coast is both cooler in summer and warmer in winter and really making for that very distinctive coastal climate. <laughs> now, like any good murder mystery or murder movie, or if, if a gun appears in the first scene, you know that it's going to come back later. So, of course, what I just said will set up something we'll come back to. We'll come back to talk about that maritime climate. And uh, at least one of the distinctive features that I'm interested in uh, when we think about the effects of climate change. So we can look at these maps, we're familiar with them. We know, you know, we're, we all kind of have this picture of the spatial patterns of climate in California. But now we're thinking about a climate that's changing over time and thinking about um, climate change impacts. And it's useful to start that discussion by thinking about the past and what is the, the climate history that got us. Now, this is a generic picture of global temperature unique to California. There are two panels here and they're split where the first one goes back 20,000 years and then the scale jump. The next one goes back to a million years. And one, there's a couple of things that are really important to see and to, and to reflect on. And again, maybe familiar to many of you. One is this extraordinary period of stability that we've been in. The Holocene is that climates have been essentially stable within plus or minus a degree for about 11,000 years. And that's a long time. Uh, you know, I'm, sorry, I'm sure we could go back to periods in history. Of course, we have less resolution when we look far back into the past. But 11,000 years, a lot can happen. And a couple of really important things have happened. One is everything about modern, about modern human civilizations has appeared within that time frame, where we put cities, agriculture, where we've developed infrastructure, everything under this relatively stable climate. The other is that 11,000 years is enough time for um, for, you know, for plants to move around on the continent and to sort themselves out with respect to climate conditions. And, you know, at, at a high level, we have the sense that a lot of natural habitats settled into a relative equilibrium with this period of stable climate. Rel I'll say relative, it's never perfect. So this is a very important part of this moment in history that we find ourselves in. The 10,000 years before that, of course, was the emergence from the last ice age. And then we go into the sequence of ice ages, you know, going back into the Pleistocene. And in particular, this very warm one, the last the last time that we had a very warm climate, about 125,000 years ago. Um, and again, the second really important thing to take away from this is here we have projections. These are some, hopefully on the high end, project, projections of the amount of climate change we could see in this century. And of course, you see how incredibly sharp, almost immediate that is relative to the historical time scale. But you see the amount of warming in this century is really comparable. It's on the same order of magnitude as the amount of warming coming out of the last ice age. So that does give us something that we can look at to at least frame ourselves and think about the kind of things that we might see in response to the changes happening this century. Although they might not all happen this century, because as you all know, plants do not always on quickly, uh, especially large trees. Now we have one um, very unusual, sorry, I just want to quickly check on something. Um, 
there's a couple hand raised and if you if you have especially if you have any problem hearing me or seeing anything if you can use the q a i have the q a open i can see it so for those of you who raised your hands or if you have a technical concern you can also put it in the chat for eddie you are well sorry i forgot to say you're welcome to put questions into the q a anytime i can see it i'll glance at it if it's immediate and I, and I need to clarify something, I might respond or I might hold it until the end. So uh, some of you may have seen this before that we have an exceptional pollen record of the response of vegetation to the, the warming at the end of the last ice age at Clear Lake in Lake County. It's actually a very stable and old lake, quite unusual geologically. Uh, this is a coring uh, rig that is taking a core from the bottom. And because what we can get from the bottom of um, lakes like this, is a record of vegetation change based on pollen. So on these on the mountains that surround Clear Lake, a lot of that, like a lot of California, is composed of pine, various species of pine, various species of oak. Both of them have wind pollinated pollen. They produce enormous quantities. A lot of that cop pollen will be blown and end up on the lake surface, drift down and end up in a core that, you know, one layer on top of the other. And that, when those cores are analyzed, we get a sense of how vegetation has changed and then various techniques can be used for dating that. When we look at Clear Lake, and this is work done quite a while ago, there's some, there's some new, um, there are some new data that we hope will be coming soon. But we look at Clear Lake, this graph goes vertically, so time is vertical coming up to the surface, thinking about those sediments on the bottom of the lake. Here's the last glacial maximum back, uh, this is 15, maybe 18,000 years, but it's realm. And what we see a range of conifers, these are some taxaceae, some things that really, pollen that can't be fully distinguished, um, and uh, that, that dominates during the last ice age. We actually have an interesting spike in pine, and then this very rapid rise in oak, just over a period of about 3,000 years. So this is in response to warming, we know that in general, oaks are found in warmer places than pines. We can show that in the modern era as well. And here we get a sense of the time scale. So this, I mean, the most important thing to take away from this is just that lesson that vegetation is not stable. Vegetation changes when climate changes. This is what nature does. This is not an aberration in any way. No, of course, you know, we're concerned. And I'll come back and talk about our concern around climate change. But we also have to recognize that nature's response is very much a natural adjustment to, you know, uh, the, the trees don't know the cause of the climate change. The trees don't know if it's the end of an ice age or humans who are messing up the atmosphere because they're going to do what is driven by the underlying biology. Um, however, there is one important caveat, and I just want to mention it because I won't have time to come back to it. The other thing that happens right about here, 13,000 years, is the arrival of Native Americans across the Bering Land Bridge. With Native Americans comes uh, almost certainly a trans, well, I would say certainly a transformation of the fire regime as as well as the utilization of plants on the landscape. So we really have to keep open, uh, I would say at this time, an uncertainty is how much this transformation, this pine oak transition, and it also this spike in pine is a response to a changing fire regime, um, as well as layered on top of that, the warming. So if you were, you know, if you go out and uh, look at a, a pine woodland and an oak woodland in California, just a couple of generic pictures, uh, to some eyes, they might not look that different, trees, you know, it depends on the discerning eye. But if you think about the transition, this is very significant. Like to convert from a pine forest to an oak woodland, a lot of tree, a lot of pine trees have to die, of course. I mean, that's the first thing to say. These are, you know, these are large, long transitions. And if we have a sense of place, if we have a sense of a certain place that we have always had been familiar, like a, a spot here that's a pine forest, that's quite a significant transition to think about that, switching over to an entirely different habitat. Uh, and that's exactly the kind of change that can be driven by, by this kind of large scale climate change. Now, the other thing that's really fascinating is this transition has also been observed in this century. Uh, Jim Thorne, some of you may have know him or heard him speak before, he's at UC Davis, um, has looked at the old maps from the Wieslander mapping uh, back in the 30s of California vegetation, and then the modern mapping we have from our modern vegetation maps. This is a, these uh, blocks here are a blow up of Western El Dorado County, west of Lake Tahoe. And he's been able to document quite a significant transition where all the red areas are places where ponderosa pine was observed back in the 30s. 
and has disappeared now. All of the green areas are areas that are the uh, new uh, gains and expansions of oak woodland in areas that did not have oak woodland. Um, and you can see, given the scale, I mean, this is happening over quite a large scale. So in addition to the transitions we see in one location with climate change, we also see transitions over space. And specifically, the one we're most tuned to is plants or animals moving uphill in response to a warming climate, just as is shown in this example, right, where elevation is increasing from left to right. But I want to dig in and look more closely. So I've just blown up, it's a little fuzzy here, but I've just jumped right into the middle of the oak woodland um, figure. And what you see here is every little patch of blue or of red is places that had oaks in the 1930s. Some of them are remaining, some of them lost. So you actually see that all this green, it's not that the oaks moved uphill from 40 kilometers away or 50 kilometers away. Uh, even th there, a lot of this is very, there was lots of oak woodland, you know, up in riparian, example, in riparian corridors, uh, possibly on deeper soils. So the, the, this is a very fine-grained process. It, it, you know, we think of large-scale migration of plants after an ice age or something, but what's happening on the ground would be just an expansion from a local stand into adjacent um, places. And you also can be almost certain that in many locations where we say that oak woodland has, gained, has been gained, that there were isolated oaks, this is probably mostly black oak, that there were isolated oaks among the pines. So it doesn't actually require that the oaks moved a lot, it's just can be the local of what were just a few isolated trees and then we get the change in vegetation. So we always have to keep in mind at a local scale, you know, what's happening very locally, it can be quite different than our picture when we step back of what we're thinking of about how vegetation may shift across the landscape. And what this really points to is the importance of fine scale heterogeneity in landscapes. And there was a question that popped up in the Q&A about aspect, and I was just saving it because this is exactly what I want to talk about for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. And this is really the work that's inspired me and gotten me um, really fascinated by California's vegetation and landscapes and thinking about how climate change may play out and then how we apply that to our conservation. This is a picture down from Carmel Valley. Hastings Natural History Reservation is a UC Berkeley research uh, reserve. Uh, it's really here just to make a point because you could take some pictures all over the coast ranges, um, all over California. Here you have a, 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 a rugged a rugged landscape, a hilly landscape. Uh, north is actually to the left here. So what we have is a review with um, you know, a gully down there and certainly at least uh, stream flow in winter, if not in summer. And that ravine on the right side, which would be north facing, looks like a mix probably of some bay, the bright green, uh, as well as um, as well as coastal live oak, almost certainly. I didn't I didn't jump down in there to see them all, but it's evergreen, evergreen mixed woodland. So that is surrounded by blue oak on the hillsides here. This is spring before they've leafed out, and then you see this patch of chamise chaparral on the south facing slope. So you come right down here, and you know this is one of like many places with where we have a chaparral patch that's only just a few meters away from the mixed oak woodland. At a large scale, we would think of these as vegetation that occupies different climates. But of course, at a small scale, it's vegetation that occupies different aspects. So this is a question that we've, oh, oh sorry, got ahead. So one of the first principles of conservation when we think about what we're calling conserving the stage. And what we mean by the stage is that those rugged heterogeneous landscapes there's actually, there's actually several different reasons for it, and they're all good, good reasons that add up. One is that a diverse landscape supports more diverse communities. I mean, what we're looking at here has three distinct communities in a very small area because of these different aspects, the different facets to, to the landscape. The other is that a rugged landscape may provide refugia, sites that are buffered from climate change. And probably the best example is plants that are dependent on some groundwater, if that groundwater is stable, um, have a better chance of hanging on, even if the adjacent hillsides might dry out, for example. The third reason is what I want to dig into a little bit more, and it's about our, the way we think about how plants may move around on landscapes at these fine scales. And these, a, a very heterogeneous landscape, and I mean physically heterogeneous, like the picture we're looking at, will allow species to reach suitable sites in the future when it's warmer without having to go far. So let me just expand on that with sort of looking at this picture uh, a little bit more. 
So I'll come back to that picture in a moment. So the work I've been doing is up at Pepperwood Preserve in Sonoma. It's a research reserve, about 3,000 acres, um, run by the Pepperwood Foundation. An extraordinary array of research is going on from breeding bird surveys. Uh, I won't get into it. Actually, today, wildfire research that's burned in the Tubbs fire and the Kincaid fire. That's been a major in my lab. But we started this work before the fires came along. Um, and one of the really neat things up in Sonoma is, and this is, a, again, part of the Bay Area's rich diversity, is that we're right at the interface between species that come down from cooler areas from the north and the northwest flora and uh, more sort of core Mediterranean taxa. And you can really see this when you look at the oaks. And this is the focus of a lot of our work, where we have black oaks and Oregon white oaks at Pepperwood, shown in the red here, which are both really you know, adap adapted to cooler conditions in general. We also have coast live oak reaching the northern end of its range, something adapted to very hot conditions, and blue oak adapted to the, the, you know, the very dry savannas, the bathtub ring around the Central Valley. And when we go into Pepper, we, we were actually able to do a very high resolution mapping thanks to a, over, a remote sensing overflight, uh, a hyperspectral image of the forests where each of these different species can be distinguished with quite a bit of accuracy. So we get a very high resolution map. Now, what we discover may won't surprise anyone here. It's just important to quantify these things and get into the details of the landscape. But one of the things that emerges very directly, and we, you know, we're able to quantify very nicely, is that these species adapted to cooler conditions are found more on north-facing slopes, cooler slopes. The species on the species that adapted to hotter conditions, like these oaks from the south, are found more on the hotter south-facing slopes when you get into this one site. So the way species partition a landscape actually reflects their broader biogeographic distributions across California in ways that I think, again, you know, when you're familiar with the plants, are, are make perfect sense. So to, I'm going to use this image. This is not pepperwood. I apologize. It's just a nice image for this. But when we go in and model how these species may respond to climate change, the next result that comes out of this, also not a complete surprise, is that these species that are sitting on the cooler facets, like this north-facing slope here, even though that, you know, that site is cooler, so it provides a little refuge for them right now, but if it gets a little bit warmer, they're getting near the edge of their tolerance because these species are adapted to cooler conditions. These species are projected to decline, to do worse in a future warmer climate. On the other hand, species that are on the south facing slopes, here's the chaparral or the blue oak, they're, they, can, they can tolerate more. They're not at the edge yet. You know, we know that chaparral in the Bay Area, or a chemise in the Bay Area, is not at the edge of its climate tolerance, right? It goes all the way down to San Diego in a lot hotter, drier, interior locations. These species, we expect, may actually find the future climate amenable uh, and have opportunities to expand if they have time, if conditions allow. And what's interesting about that is as it gets hotter, the species that are now in the south-facing slope may be able to expand and occupy that north facing slope. And if that continues, you would of course have an entire landscape covered in chaparral. Again, that's what it might look more like San Diego, where we have chemise on north and south, where it's more at the center of its range there. So for these species, they don't have to go very far. So this migrate, this problem of this, this response to climate change may, may be easier, if I may use that word, in the sense that there's more possibilities. But now the question, but there's a couple of questions that come up from this. Um, and, and to think about those, we need to sort of think about the way that it can really, the, the different species may, fa may face very different challenges in terms of how far they may need to move if they're gonna find sites where they can live in the future. And this is a concept that we introduced actually more than 10 years ago now we call the velocity of climate change. Um, some of you may have come across it. And it was, a, it was sort of a deceptively simple idea, but one that's been very powerful to help guide our thinking. And really what it comes down to, the easiest way to think about it is how fast does a plant or an animal have to move to keep up with a changing climate? And that, that velocity, and it's, it's, and it's literally just framed, you know, it is a velocity, just like if you're driving in a car, except it's kilometers per year, not kilometers per hour. That velocity is very much a function of the landscape. 
So where we have rugged landscapes, like in the mountains, those velocities are lower. Just the exact example I showed you. A plant may be able to jump across to another hillside. In flat landscapes, like in the Central Valley, they can be much higher. So that this, this ruggedness, this is again another way of saying how important it is to think about how rugged and heterogeneous these landscapes are. But what we discovered when we dug into this is actually it's, it is an, a really interesting asymmetry. So bear with me for a while. This is kind of the deepest into the weeds we'll go and then we'll pull back out. That, that how, far, um, how far plants may need to move depends on where, whether we're thinking about what we, what we call outbound or inbound. And the analogy is exactly like the analogy to say airport. There's the outbound flights that are headed out, there's inbound flights that have come from somewhere else. The outbound problem is how far will these plants have to move to find a suitable site if it gets much more in the future? And as you can see here, you know, this chemise has a pretty short outbound problem. You can just jump across to this valley, but these could have a much longer outbound problem. So they may have to go much further. So that's thinking about the future of the plants we're seeing right here. Inbound problem is a little different. Now the question is, where will plants come from in the future? Where does the future flora of a landscape come from? And this is a different way of thinking about it because a lot of our thinking is driven by our familiarity with local species. So if the climate is warming, what is gonna be the impact on the local species? And that's kind of an outbound problem. Like where are those species going? Where do we need to take them? Maybe? But if you're a park manager, if you're responsible for San Bruno Mountain, for the Presidio, you don't get to follow the plants necessarily. You're managing a piece of land. And that management problem is really an inbound problem. Like what plants will grow well in the future in the landscape that I'm responsible for? Could be plants that I wanna bring in and plant. We can talk about that later. Could be plants that will arrive naturally, eventually by birds, by wind. Of course, it could be invasives or natives, right? And, and a, a lot of our concern is about how quickly invasives can move. Inbound problem. You know, and again, I'm, uh, there's a question in the uh, chat about, about wildflowers, which I appreciate. I think you'll pick up if you haven't already. I'm a very tree oriented uh, ecologist. So almost everything I'll say, if not everything, will be very focused on trees. The principles are general. But I think a lot about the woody plants that really define the habitats, the ones that really structure, you know, structure the landscape in terms of the kind of vegetation, structure habitats for animals. Within that is, of course, this incredibly rich flora of all the herbaceous plants and the grasses. So when we, jump, when we go back to Sonoma County, we've, just, we've looked at this problem. What, what could be inbound at Pepperwood? If it's too hot in the future for some of those plants and we're looking for other species that might arrive and do well, and we've looked through the woody flora of the coastal range, actually of most of California, and actually run some models to say, okay, here's some species that are projected to do well in the future at Pepperwood, but they're not there now. So what, what could come into this landscape? There's, uh, there's some that are interesting and very familiar, like Prunus alicifolia, not too far away in Napa, doesn't get up to this part of Sonoma. So that's not too far. Now that's a reasonable, you know, maybe could arrive locally. Platinus, that's an interesting one, more often, you know, riparian and, and ash and you know, some willows. But there aren't candidates. And then to really find like another oak, for example, that could become the dominant oak of a landscape, the next one is Quercus anglomania. And you got to go a lot, you have to go a long way to find Quercus anglomaniae all the way in Southern California, right? To the nearest populations. So this, so we really face this problem in this century as climates warm, that you know, some plants may be able to move locally. And then for some things, these long distance jumps would be important. And these jumps far exceed the natural velocity. Thank you for a question in the chat. The natural velocity of plant migration. It's really controlled by three factors. The larger the population of a plant, the more seeds that a plant population produces, the more likely that at least some of them go a long way. So it's much harder for rare plants to move long distances than for plants. And this is a really important reason for having, you know, conserving large populations and just for all of our conservation work. If we're relying on natural dispersal, we need large populations because the, because the long distance events are quite rare. So the population size is really important. Um, the, I said three factors, and I think I'll just reduce that to two. The second one is basically the dispersal biology. You know, how does that seed move? 
Now, wind dispersed seeds, the occasional, like an ash, right, or a maple or a willow. Most seeds will fall nearby. The occasional seed can get picked up in a plume of wind, taking it higher in the atmosphere, drift a long way. Hawaii is covered in native plants. Hawaii is 5,000 miles from the nearest continent. So we know, given enough time, that plants just have these extraordinary, rare, long distance events. They almost see, they really do seem, frankly, impossible that Hawaii would have so many native plants, but, but they're rare and it takes a lot, you know, and they don't happen often and we don't have a long time to wait. And then when we get to, you know, things like oaks, they're carried by jays, they're carried by squirrels. It is exceedingly rare to see an acorn move more than a kilometer. You know, the, the occasional, must be a very motivated jay that picks up an acorn and flies a kilometer before it stashes it in a, you know, in a, or, or a woodpecker you know, in a seed tree or buries it. And then, uh, and then of course, the longer plants come to take to, that was my third factor, the longer that, longer that plants take to grow to maturity, the longer it is before you have a new generation that can disperse again. So if an acorn moves a kilometer, but then it takes 10 or 20 years to have that oak grow into a mature tree before it moves another kilometer, generation time is of course very slow. So what does that add up to? The things we call invasives, short generation time, large populations, and small seeds. Those are all the formula, formula that allow them to move really quickly, which is of course part of why we call them invasive. And these trees face a, a much more difficult if we're relying on natural dispersal. So, um, okay, so that's the first part of the talk. I just want to share with you, this is, we, we, this is something we thought a lot about, this aspect, how we can use aspect both as a conservation tool, but also some of the challenges it presents for different parts of the flora, and, and there's more we can say about it. For the second half, for, I just want to take a few minutes and talk about something you may have been hearing about in the news and reading about, or maybe some of you are participating in or have gone to some of the public meetings. And that is this very exciting made by the governor and um, the, the Natural Resources Agency and all their collaborators to commit California to our goal of what's being called 30 by 30, conserving at least 30% of California's land and coastal waters by 2030. Uh, the federal government under the Biden administration has made a similar commitment and they're looking at this problem nationally. And it's also part of a, a long dialogue now about uh, at an international level about different um, different different jurisdictions, different countries that are looking at this. Um, so there's really three, in my mind, there's kind of three key components to the 30 by 30 commitment. And this is one way I think about them, which is, you know, we have to, to conserve, to connect, and then to manage change. So that that initial commitment to 30%, that just speaks to the fact that the core of biodiversity conservation is protected lands and open space. It can be urban open space. And of course, we're very committed to increasing access for urban populations, the importance of local parks. You know, parks are for people and for our plants and biodiversity. But we know that um, we're worried about climate change, but at this point, we certainly can't turn our back on um, habitat loss has always been the primary driver of the loss of biodiversity of housing, of farmland, and of course, these very, very painful conflicts between the siting of renewable energy, which of course we are desperately in need of to avoid further climate change, which of course is a major occupier of land and can have impacts. And we, we have to be honest with ourselves that we have trade-offs that we have to address um, in, in pursuing our clean energy goals. But it's nothing compared to the damages of global, you know, the global impacts of continued use of fossil fuels. So that core commitment to open space is of course a key. My lab involved, this is one of my, a student of mine who finished recently did a really, really nice analysis of, um, of a team thinking about how to prioritize conservation specifically for California's native plants. And this does bring in much more of the herbaceous flora, which is where most of the diversity of course is, is found. These maps, I, I find these maps fascinating to learn. They take a moment to think about the first one is how intact is the landscape? And this is a map that can be developed using the density of roads, the size of, of um, parcel of, of, pro of property and the conversion to agriculture. So of course, Central Valley is not intact at all. The Bay Area is not intact, the basin is not intact. 
Here's the foothills, a little lighter, and then we get into the mountains and the deserts that are the most intact ecosystems. So intactness is a good criterion when we're looking for, of course, large scale conservation opportunities. The second though, is whether that land is unprotected. If land is already protected, it is not a priority because we've already taken care of it, we've protected it. And this map here actually brings them together. So the dark blue in this map shows the areas of intact and unprotected, i.e. private California. So the North Coast is really interesting, Sierra Nevada foothills and both on the interior coast range and on the Sierra side, um, as well as the Big Sur, Wil the Big, Big Sur and little pack patches down in Southern California, some, and, and kind of patchy in the North and Northeast. So those are our opportunities. Then we intersect that, and I won't go into the methods here. This was a this is a project looking at all evolutionary relationships and what's called phylogenetic diversity, how closely related species are as a component of our conservation priorities. But looking at the plant diversity and overlaying it with those opportunities, um, Matt Kling, who did this work, you know, picked out a bunch of quadrants in our California map that jump out as just key opportunities at the top, at the top of the rankings for high plant diversity, intact and unprotected. And again, this is now a subset of that North Coast, um, some of the, the Sierra Nevada foothills and some, of the, and some of the places along the coast. And if we look at these, you know, these are some habitats that um, will be from uh, the, some of the coastal grasslands, some of the interior grasslands like Mount Hamilton, Northern Sierra. I have still not been to Table Mountain, but I, from the pictures I see, I have a feeling that might be um, Table Mountain up near Oroville. And then uh, one that jumped out which was particularly interesting, was around Point Conception, around Santa Barbara, uh, west of Santa Barbara. And just as this work was being done and the paper was actually in review, um, many of you will know that this was one of the most important conservation uh, investments in California in recent years when Jack Dangermont, the founder of Esri, the mapping software, gave a major gift to the Nation Conservancy to purchase and set aside this very large ranch at Point Perception. So this was just a wonderful synergy. We can we have we claim no credit for this work, our research, because this was obviously already well in progress. But it was a complete synergy that just as we released the study pointing to uh, that region as jumping out of our analyses, it was an you know, important conservation uh, investment. The second of my three priorities that connect, uh, conserve, and connect. And connect is about the importance of connectivity in landscape conservation. And this is actually, I'll just start with this, you know, here's an example in a picture like this. A riparian corridor like this becomes a very important, you know, just a highway for movement for plants and animals. For example, plants that might want to, or animals that are up in these woodlands, being able to come down along a corridor between agricultural lands and then potentially make it to uh, natural lands on the other side. And this has been the subject of a lot of analysis in California, these mapping analyses, these yellow areas, looking for priority corridors to connect up the large areas of protected land and really make them more value, valuable by allowing plants and animals to move between them. What's really interesting right now, and it's getting us thinking about the problem differently, is historically connectivity was about wildlife. So these are maps, these are beautiful maps, uh, from both the Yellowstone area, but also Northern California, of deer migration and elk migration, we're able to put collars on animals and watch them move. And of course, this gives us these incredibly important information about where corridors will be important for wildlife movement, right? To connect up populations and let them move between different is the problem of wildlife and gene flow moving between populations. But now we're facing a slightly different problem. Because now we're not talking about wildlife maybe migrating from winter to summer and summer to winter. It's really about this long-term movement of species in response to a changing climate. And this is just very conceptual here, but just to illustrate the point that just building on what I've been saying, all these movements that we expect, whether they're small scale or large scale, will be from places that are currently warmer to places that are cooler in the future. Uh, well, sorry, cooler now. And in the future, they may be just the temperature that is appropriate for the species that are moving. 
And now, and I warned you, the winter summer thing would come back. So here we're coming back. What's so fascinating about the California coast, especially, is that these corridors and the way that plants may move are actually did are actually in the opposite direction, depending on whether they're more sensitive to summer or more tied to winter. So the way to think about that is if we have a plant that is very sensitive to summer drought, then in the future it might do better moving towards the coast to offset warming. But a plant that's very sensitive to frost, like a more subtropical plant that is now on the coast, may have an opportunity to move the opposite direction as it gets warmer in the interior. So even on the same gradients, even on the same spatial patterns, different plants with different physiology can be moving in opposite directions. And this is something we see in a lot of examples all around the world that we just can't can never sort of underestimate how diverse the responses are of different species, how different their physiology may be, their dependence on other species, pollinators, dispersers, particular aspects of the habitat. And it certainly creates a lot of challenges for, for conservation planning because we have to make commitments to certain you know, pieces of land. Um, but, uh, but this takeaway is that we're rethinking the entire underlying theory behind corridors. It's not going beyond animal movement, which has driven a lot of it, and thinking about these longer term capacity of plants to move. Also thinking about how corridors are not always the best thing. So for example, a corridor can allow a fire to spread, whereas if there was a vineyard or an agricultural field, the fire would stop. Or a corridor can allow a disease to spread. So there are also cases where, and when we think it from a conservation standpoint, where allowing plants to have isolated populations can protect them from, uh, especially from the spread of disease is one of the ones to be, to be very concerned about. So there's no, no magic bullets in this space, but these are the competing uh, trade-offs we need to think about. And the final point is going back to where I started, which is really about what does it mean to manage for a changing environment? And this, I think, is the one that is the, the biggest challenge for us. But, you know, we're very attached. We're very, we're very, we're very attached to the landscapes we've grown up with, the landscapes we've gotten to know well, and it's really hard to imagine them changing and that being just sitting okay at basic value level, just accepting that those changes are somewhere between inevitable, but not just inevitable, but in many cases desirable because if the plants don't move, they can't survive. Some of them won't be able to survive in the places they live now, and. If we're resistant to some of these changes, there are things I think that we will lose that if they're able to move on their own or with our assistance, it gives them a chance to survive. So what are, what are of course, the things that are driving change? Fire, I don't need to say more about that right now. Uh, maybe most, I mean, actually maybe the main thing to say is one, one of the biggest concerns in the Sierra is very large fires that create large patches and leave trees leave no seed trees to send pine seeds in for regrowth and that's where we get a conversion of forest to shrubland this is being seen quite widely uh, in California and the west drought you know those, those trees that died in 2016 uh, and now of course we're back in another drought they're still they're out there they're falling down they're creating future fire risk uh, of course, we all saw these images of the conifers. This is a site that we worked at down near San Luis Obispo with, with valley oaks, losing contact with groundwater. And even, even large old valley oaks dying in that drought, which is quite something to see. So we're back in a severe drought and we'll, you know, we're just, well, it's wait and see or, or, or it's all too evidence right now about additional waves of mortality. That is climate change in action. It's too hot, it's too dry. And that means plants that have lived there in the past, it's not a site that, they may find, that they're find, gonna find suitable or be able to survive. So that brings us back to our inbound problem. What is gonna survive there? What is the vegetation of that site gonna look like? Because we want, you know, something will be there. And of course, disease, sudden oak death being the most familiar, another transformative agent. So even while we're thinking about climate change, the way climate change plays out, you know, is the average climate does not kill the plants. It's either an extreme event or it's gonna be a fire event or a disease. Maybe not all of them even caused by climate change, but of course the plants that are regenerating have to do it in a new climate. So all of these factors are interacting 
and and often hard to. Um, so a, a lot of our vegetation management questions will be um, questions about whether we can manage some of these transitions and whether we want to manage them. And in many cases, our initial reaction is to want to stop the transition, to try to keep an oak woodland, is my example here. If that oak woodland can't survive because of changing fire, um, it could become a chemise chaparral, it could become you know, a French broom hillside. And a lot of our, I think in many, I think there'll be many situations that I, and they're happening right now. And this is of course, what restoration ecology will look like in the 21st century. It's not all restoring in the sense of going back to something that we believe was there. It's about using the tools of restoration to transition vegetation towards a future that really we think is compatible with the climate that's coming. Now, of course, one of the questions about this is our role. And I think this is an audience of sure we have many people who think about this, about whether we'll play an active role moving plants. And there's also a question in the Q&A about, um, about genetic engineering, about you know, uh, creating organisms that have greater tolerance to heat resistance. Um, some of those will be feasible for some plants, but of course, some you know, there's some plants that we're not going to be out planting all of them. Genetic engineering requires that we've created a stock in a, in a nursery and just, you know, just, just we don't have the capacity in, in sort of nursery horticulture to do things that can take entire landscapes to scale. Of course, we can do some of those things, um, some of those things locally. And um, now this is this image I've used for a long time in talks. This came from the Boston Globe in 2008. Don't ask me why. Globe was thinking about someone carrying a rat or maybe generously an opossum across the Golden Gate Bridge as their image for assisted migration. But it does make the point that, of course, these are questions that um, we'll have to act. It's a tool. And like any tool, my well, my view on this is we shouldn't take any tool out of our toolbox a priori. Um, it really is going to be case by case to know whether this is an appropriate uh, kind of tool to be using for individual conservation problems. So um, take us back to that first image. Um, just uh, a bunch of my own favorites of our spectacular diversity. I'll, I think I can, evident again, I lean towards the woody plants, <laughs> but a few favorite wildflower, a few favorite wildflowers in there as well. Uh, maybe this is, you know, I should replace this image. That tree is actually gone. That's an old blue oak down outside at the Blue Oak Reserve, actually, UC Reserve. And then big storm came along in a dry year, I think, and uh, that tree is gone. And that's that's the symbol that none of these things, of course, live forever. And what we're, what we're concerned about in the long run is how the dynamics of the vegetation will, will play out over time and um, what, it, what our landscapes will look like in the future. So I'll just leave it with some acknowledgments to a lot of students, postdocs in my lab, a wonderful group who support, who do a lot of this work and support this work and uh, are, are behind a lot of the ideas we've been developing. Um, please Q A and then Eddie, I'm also happy at your question. If you all go to, um, you know, people asking questions, I'm unmuting that. Well, actually we're in webinar, that may not be possible. So we may be dependent on Q and A. So I'll stop there for a moment. Hey, thanks so much, David. Have you uh, have you got uh, some energy and time to go look at some things in the Q and A? You're you're generating a lot of uh, curiosity and questions. <laughs> you're talking. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So we touched on some of them. So let me just go. Let me just review what's in there. We touched on started out with questions about aspect. That was a great setup for thing I've been fascinated by these north and south slopes. Um, uh, Oh, just a very yeah high level question about Mediterranean ecosystems um, and increasing drought. One of the really important um, phenomena that we really I think we understand quite well now is you know drought is a combination of heat and heat and water, right? You know, and anyone who gardens and I sadly cannot count. I am a terrible gardener, so I cannot count myself among this crowd. But um, you know, a dry year is a lot harder for a garden if it's hot because of course it increases demand on the plants. So the warming, warming is effectively increasing the intensity of droughts, even if rainfall doesn't change. 
And even if rainfall increases a little bit, because of the Mediterranean climate, it increases in winter. And it's the hot summers that are, of course, when we really experience it. So Mediterranean climates, I think, are, are almost inevitably in most locations going to experience the future as more intense drought, just driven by the temperature and um, given our rainfall pattern. So I think the vulnerability question is about the vulnerability of Mediterranean type biodiversity as a whole. Um, uh, can I make a generic statement? I'd probably be making it up, right? I mean, I, I don't know if we, uh, how easy it will be to compare different parts of the world and how vulnerable they'll be. You know, on the one hand, we do have a lot of drought tolerance. So if there's something for us to lean on, it's the fact that we do have plants that have adapted to drought. Now the question is how much more intense a drought um, can they handle? Um, in some cases, it will be not local. I mean, you know, if the Mediterranean flora of San Diego region may be able to do better in Santa Barbara or Santa Barbara and San Francisco. So there may be local vulnerability, even if we do have plants in the flora that can do well. And there are some places that I think, um, you know, there's some projections that the Amazon could pass tipping points where it's just not composed of plants that are, that start out from being very drought adapted. So, and very fire adapted, of course. So I guess I'd say that cuts both ways, um, but we also have a lot of local plants, local endemics, of course, and that may find it you know, makes them especially vulnerable. They're very hard to move um, when you start with very rare vocal plants. So I guess that's a typical academic answer. A little of this and a little of that. It's hard to make a single commitment to that. Um, um, uh, a, very, a very good direct question to combat climate change. Should we be focusing on planting oak trees over other species? Let's think about that ways, but what it means to combat climate change. The, the, the first is whether, you know, for, the first is, and which we didn't talk about at all today, is about the role of trees and, and soils about taking carbon from the atmosphere. So I'm sure you've been see, you're seeing a lot about tree planting as an important part of our climate strategies. And, and that's true. There are a lot of places where there's huge potential for reforestation, mainly places that used to be forest and the forests have been cut down, a lot of the tropics especially. Uh, our redwood region, reforesting redwoods, you know, redwoods hold more carbon per acre than any other forest ecosystem in the world, and they grow pretty fast as well. There is a danger, and unfortunately, the tree planting craze has gone a little out of control, and there's quite a few places around the world already where there have been projects literally removing native vegetation to plant faster growing trees. And frankly, in most cases, there's a reason fast growing trees didn't live in those places. You know, they're either too dry or poor soils. And the vegetation is there is, you know, the best adapted there is. So the tree planting has gone overboard in the desire to plant trees in places that are really not suitable for them. Now in California, oaks are, you know, oaks have some carbon. They're not gonna, they're not gonna be the magic, they're not, there's no magic bullet on climate change. They're not like a redwood. They grow more slowly, but they will last you know, that even in the face of fire. So oaks are resilient and all of the evidence we have from the past is yes, the future of California has more oaks in many places, you know, fewer pines like we've seen in the foothills. Um, and they're probably a good bet. Coast live oak, <laughs> there could be a lot, there could be even more coast live oak in our future. If we look at the fact that we're at the Northern end of the range and it comes all the way to San Diego, that, that's a plant that can tolerate quite, high, quite warm climates. Now the question is, can the individual trees that live in the Bay Area tolerate those warm climates? And now we get into questions of the genotypes. Are the genotypes of coastal live oak in the Bay Area as tolerant of heat as the genotype of the coastal live oak from San Diego? Even to keep the same species on the landscape, will we need to move in different genotypes? We have very little data on that. What we know for oaks is that there, there's a lot of variability. You know, we, there's no evidence that they are super specialized to their local climate because their pollen moves so far, um, there's been so much gene flow that whatever adaptations to climate are sort of very, they're modest and there's, there's really a lot of local tolerance. So we hope that, that some of these oaks, blue oaks and coast live, you know, that there's a lot of resilience there. Um, the question about you know, wildflowers in general, I've already, I've already showed, my, showed my cards that I think, I, I think much more about the trees. I think with the herbaceous flora, um, you know, one aspect of the resilience of the herbaceous flora is that actually, I think mostly about moving in, moving in 
in space. Like if a tree lives here now, where could it live in the future? The beautiful thing about our wildflower flora is it can move in time by which, and I just mean within the year, instead of germinating in March, if it germinates in February, that's actually a shift that offsets climate change because it's actually germinated at a time that is, that is now you know, the appropriate climate. And a lot of those germination triggers are in fact you know, built in. So we already see that happening. We see plants you know, blooming earlier and that, that earlier blooming definitely offsets climate change. Now there's gonna be a limit. They can only go so much earlier. The winter may be too small. They may need um, you know, vernalization over the winter for their germination requirements. But, but and, and then since they go to seed, the annual plants, they're, they have the greatest tolerance of all of getting through the summer because in fact, they go completely dormant. So, so some of those might, that, those characteristics could give them uh, a fair amount of resilience. And we have to think about you know, whether they handle fire and, and, and other things. Um, the next question about natural velocity, we talked about that, about seed dispersal, um, the genetic engineering. Um, I, <laughs> you know, some of this is sort of how much of a techno optimist, whether, whether you're someone drawn to the, the kind of, um, you know, the technology can, can be a major tool versus those who are more techno-cautious, I'll say, who are looking more for natural solutions based in the natural environment. I probably lean towards the techno-cautious side where I'd rather work with the plants we have, but I, I said it myself, we shouldn't take tools out of the toolbox. And certainly, certainly for crops, the genetic engineering is essential. I mean, heat resistant, drought resistant. That's happening, of course, and it's always happened with breeding. The question is, is there a place and an effectiveness for gene editing for plants that we would then consider, you know, wild plants in, in our wildlands? And I think that'll be limited. There's also just not much of an economic, there's not much of a market for it. Of course, for agriculture, there's a huge market for that work. That's expensive work. Uh, and, and it really probably will only be done where there's a real, some kind of market driver for, for work at that scale. Um, a question about reducing fossil fuels. Uh, I think I'm so glad you asked because because I should we should never pass that over. Everything I said is about how plants will be impacted by climate change, and everything I said is less of an issue if the climate change is less. The only true solution that allows plants and landscapes time to adapt is for the climate to change more slowly. The faster it changes, the more dramatic, the more the more we can have fires with no recovery or droughts with long periods of recovery. If it changes slower, it just gives all of our ecosystems more time. So um, none of this should be taken as a substitution for everything we're doing to reduce fossil fuel use and increase renewable energy. And, and we're just lucky to be in California, which is a leader to be part of a community of a, of a place that's trying to push that forward so much. Um, uh, let me just jump ahead a little bit. Um, yeah, another question about uh, understanding the tolerance of plants in relation to moving them. And that's absolutely, uh, that, that's very important. So, um, you know, the reason that we look, like I showed you those maps of the oaks. And one of the reasons that we focus so much on those range maps is those range maps give us the first estimate of the tolerance of the plant. Like, where does it live now? That is our, especially for something that we, is widespread. Um, for rare species, my, I can't back this up with a lot of data, but I, I'm pretty confident that there's very, that rare species are, are rarely restricted because they're so restricted in their climate tolerance that they can only live right there. It's just not how plants work to have a climate tolerance that's so narrow that would say they're restricted to Mount Tam, like a local endemic. Those I think are other causes of, of rarity and endemism. So almost certainly those rare plants have tolerances that are bigger than we know. And the only way to find it out is to get into greenhouses or experimental plantings and, and, and figure out what the, where they are, or maybe use close relatives as a good guide. The trees are helpful because they're so widespread that we get a better sense of what the edges of their tolerance are. Not, not all trees, these big common trees. Um, the challenge with the trees is if, you, if we move a tree now, we, if we, we have to move it, we can't move it so far that the seedling is, is beyond its tolerance to get started, but then, it can't, but then it also has to be tolerant in 30 years or 50 years or 100 years. 
So that's a particular challenge with um, with moving trees is about is about capturing their tolerance at both ends of their uh, of life of their lifespan. Um, Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. So a question about the, the the background of my picture there. Some some people may recognize it right away. The 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 Temla Range on the east side of the Carrizo Plain. I I had never been there until the last super bloom, 2018, and boy, what a treat! Even just to get a day down there, um, just wandering around in, in those hills, in Carrizo. Um, no, this is a this is a very interesting question. What does the climate transition mean for sequestration capacity? And I I think we're, if we talk about carbon sequestration. So it appears that existing landscapes are able to support more trees, which are sequestering more carbon. Um, I think that this is a very, I mean, this is, this is a really important connection. You know, carbon sequestration is the result of a physiological process of photosynthesis. And that photosynthesis requires that the plant is living in a place that the conditions are appropriate, right? So it, so if, if conditions change too much and the trees are not photosynthesizing or if they're dying from a drought, then we lose the sequestration capacity. So in a lot of places, the, the amount of carbon will go down on the landscape. You know, drier ecosystems have less carbon. The desert has less carbon than oak woodland and oak woodland has less carbon than a redwood. And as it gets hotter and drier, forests will probably become lower density, fewer trees with less carbon. But we still have to go all in to make sure that those trees that are there can, you know, persist in the landscape and we don't lose them all, for example, to a drought. So in many cases, we may need to have short term loss of carbon, like by thinning forests, which, of course, is also part of our fire management strategy. As a trade off for long term storage, because if because leaving high density forests is makes them more vulnerable to drought, more vulnerable to fire. So there's definitely going to be some short and long-term trade-offs. And then as it gets warmer, we just can't expect some of these ecosystems to hold and store as much carbon as they do now. So we are going to see declines. We've already seen declines. Um, uh, uh, there's a very nice question going back about Native American burning, about um, Public lands. Um, and about the, the, you know, what's the real commitment of academic communities and government conservation working with indigenous communities? Um, I that is a work in progress. And I think the best thing we can say that it is it has increased a lot. Uh, I think many of you know this in your day-to-day -day life, the Black Lives Matter movement. I think for a lot of us in California and the West, oh, really, it shouldn't just be here, but was equally a prompt to really think more deeply about the indigenous history. It's probably it's one of the things I've done the most reading on in the last year is California Indian history. And, um, and certainly some of the tribes, I mean, I'll just tell you one anecdote, the Karuk tribe in Northern California, you know, they face a situation that, where they want to bring burning back on their land. And they have some opportunities to burn, but they need a permit from Cal Fire. But they're holding out because they feel like they they are not subject to state government as an independent and as a sovereign nation. So they they really feel very strongly that that having to get that permit is not an appropriate relationship between them and our government in terms of how they manage the land. And they're really in for the long haul about wanting to establish those the sovereignty there is more important than a short-term win to sort of you know, do a pres particular prescribed fire. So that's just one small example of how the, the social and political relationships will be key to that long-term transformation. I would say there's a lot of good talk right now. There's a lot of people who you know talking about bringing indigenous burning back. Um, but every time that every time the fire season heats up like it is right now, saw the articles in the Chronicle about how the Forest Service says no prescribed burning, we just have to deal with putting the fires out. It's just so hard to keep that think that commitment to prescribed burning going when we get into fire season, which is now dominating a whole lot of the year. So I can only hope, I hope we're on the right path. Um, um, hey, Dan, Dan, uh, Dan Glusenkamp, one familiar name here. A uh, point about Engelman Oaks um, and how they're planted. So this is really, 
an important point. So, you know, as native plant aficionados, we're, we all, we're often focused on where the native populations are and can they, you know, could they, can these native populations move in response to climate change, for example. But I think we all know that many invasive plants, for example, or, or non-natives didn't arrive by accident. They started in people's gardens or they started as, you know, in agriculture or they were being used for different purposes. And something like an engelman, like a landscape plant. So actually the seed source, the seed source for future populations of what might be out on our, you know, wild, wild landscapes could of course come from plantings. And if there are plants, um, you know, do we mind, do we mind that it was planted first in a horticultural setting and then those seeds became the source of what becomes a, um, you know, a, a, a quote unquote native population? For that matter, what is a native population going to be? And, um, and this of course is, Dan asked a question also about about our, our collections and certainly all the collecting we do now gives us a sense of what things where things were and what they looked like of course they're all a lot of them are scrambled already we know that very well you know just by land use history of the last hundred years but and that's why the historical collections can be such a guide um so i my guess is in 50 years we probably won't be very comfortable even saying what is a native population you know just it'll be so those lines as, as, as systems change so much. Um, and it requires us to sort of rethink some of the, the concepts we use. Um, a question about cross hybridizing to produce hybrid for certain species. I think it brings us back to the breeding. Um, you know, it's certainly part of crop breeding, and, and you know, that's why we have hybrid corn because. Reading between distinct strains can bring out, you know, more more vigorous individuals. Um, certainly, in nature, you know, out gen, outbreeding in general is very important, right? To avoid close inbreeding that leads to genetic effects or or genetic depression. Um, but for example, oaks hybridize a lot, and you know, we have a lot of very vibrant hybrids. I don't know if we have. Uh, vigor among those hybrids, whether they're sort of doing better than the parents, whether or they're just hanging on. Because once you get far, too far apart, those hybrids become actually less fit to the environment on either side, and they may only exist in certain intermediates. So that's a continuum. Uh, again, I think my I think my main take on it is, is similar to the genetic engineering. It's just like there's only very limited circumstances where we'll be able to actually go out and do these things ourselves at scale. At this, you know, thinking about the scale of all of California in those in those certain circumstances, it can be very important. Um, uh, but we have to attend to these larger landscapes where, um, you know, nature is going to take over and do what, do what it does. So that actually leads to a question about the role of selection and climate change, um, and variability. So absolutely. So there's sort of two schools of thought about how the role of evolutionary responses with climate change. One is that it just won't be fast enough, that climate change is happening so quickly, certainly for long-lived oaks, for example. Um, you know, with generation times of decades or, and, and lifespans of centuries, evolutionary responses will be slow. Now, as it happens, there is a lot of variability in those populations. So when we play the long game, when we give the species 3,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 years, we can certainly expect evolutionary responses. But in the case, course of this century, it'll be more limited. Um, although, you know, could be why one tree survives and one doesn't in terms of the variability we see. Now for wildflowers, though, for annual plants, of course, this is totally different. And that cuts both ways because it's also why, you know, weeds are able to evolve very quickly. Our own native wildflowers may be able to evolve very quickly. So that other school of thought is that if you get down to something that's breeding every year, then evolutionary responses could be very important. But just much, you know, I mean, you all know, it, you, can see two, you can see two species most of the time, except for those cryptic things in our flora, but you just can't see genotypes unless it's an unusual you know, different flower colors. So we just know so much less about genetic diversity than we know about all of the species diversity that's out there. Um, and that doesn't underplay its importance. It's just that we're rarely on top of what, you know, the information we need. Um, let's take three more minutes. We'll end up at 8.45. Um, yeah, going back to the, Forests. It's interesting about our, you know, denser, our denser forests 
um, able to keep ambient local temperatures cooler and would just re reduce the chances of trees dying from, from drought and, and preserving soil moisture. So yes, uh, yes, that's true. A dense forest, you know, blocks out the sun. We actually have really good studies of how after a fire, the, the wildflower pop communities shift towards more hotter adapted um, from cooler adapted just because of that effect. I think the challenge is just that when it gets really dry, the forest just won't, the density, it has density, dense forests require water so that we can't force these forests to be, you know, denser than is supported by those habitats in a natural setting. You actually mentioned in the question, the Miyawaki method. That's a reading, there's reading for me because I am not familiar with that. So I'll go um, check what that is. But, but we, again, when we just thinking about large scale landscapes beyond what can be managed sort of acre by acre, those forest densities are going to be, in large measure, are going to be sort of set by those natural relationships. Um, but when they open up, they absolutely, the soils dry out and that becomes um, a little bit of a, um, uh, to a positive feedback. Um, how about a last talk, a last question about fog. We talked all about the coast, but didn't even get to the fog. The presence of fog is a hugely moderating force with drought. Uh, some of you know the number that redwoods can get 25% of their water from, from frog drip. Maritime chaparral has very important adaptations for salt and wind. I'm paraphrasing the question. Um, and uh, uh, sorry, I'm trying to extract the key of this question. Um, well, uh, it's actually, it's, it's, okay. Okay, I'm glad you brought it up. There's a lot, there's a lot to say that it's one of the areas of the greatest uncertainty. Um, climate models are very bad at dealing with the future of fog. And we've actually seen some evidence of it declining. Uh, there's other places where it seems to be stable or increasing. Um, some of you may have seen a story that the that fog decreased in the Central Valley in the last 50 years, and it actually looks like it's tied to, to reduced air pollution because air pollution the little nucleating factors for fog to form. So Thule fogs have been worse in the 20th century due to air pollution from cars. So that's tied in, that's a little bit of a sidebar. Um, as a management, uh, as a management problem, vegetation managers on the coast certainly can think about this, the structure of different plants. Taller plants will intercept fog and bring water. And that could be a, a sort of restoration tool in thinking about them. And then the end of the question is about, well, won't plants be expected to trans transition through different plant communities and ecosystems and not in isolation? Um, that's a lot, you know, it's a, that, there's a lot packed into that, but um, you know, I, I think there's two, I guess let me just wrap up with two, two different thoughts here. On the one hand, every plant is out there doing its thing, right? You know, this is um, the core of, sort of the mechanisms of ecology and evolution, of course, interacting with all the organisms around it. We certainly know that one species can disappear from a community and the rest persist. The loss of chestnut in the Eastern United States did not lead to the collapse of deciduous forests, right? Other things became more common. So that idea that, the cer that a certain set of species is really tightly linked doesn't really hold up when we see examples of, you know, a new species can invade, one species can disappear. It doesn't always or necessarily lead to the collapse of the rest of them. On the other hand, there can be very tight relationships, you know, whether it's the redwoods intercepting fog and bringing it down and without the redwoods, all the things that live under it are dependent on that. So of course, there's a lot of very uh, dependencies among species. So it's not that there are very really tight communities that will move as a whole. And of course, they have different dispersal biology and different adaptations. But some of those relationships, it may turn it may turn out that once one species is impacted, that it, that you know there's a spillover effect to the rest. There's a concept out there of non-analog communities, which are communities that could exist in the future that we don't see now, and we know they existed in the past. So the communities we see today are not all the possible communities that plants can form into, and we have to be sort of open to the possibility of combinations that at first might seem kind of strange and not not like part of ours our typology of sort of, oh, these are the communities we expect to see. And then you realize that some of those plants may be able to live together just fine when we have different climates that they're, that they're sort of mixing and matching. 
All right. That was all sorts of wonderful questions and, and jumping here and there and everywhere with answers. <laughs> so uh, a real pleasure. I'm sorry not to see more faces in person. Oh, yeah. well, David, that, that was, <laughs> you get the prize for the most questions ever asked of one of our <laughs> presenters. I mean, that, that your research is just fascinating and I know it inspired these questions. So, and it shows uh, how hungry and curious people are about you know, the impacts of climate change on, on, our, on our habitats here. So really, really appreciate you sharing your research um, in such an entertaining way. Yeah, well, it's always a pleasure. It would be, yes, it's always a pleasure. And it's, it, I haven't, I, I, maybe there are people in this audience, I'm sure I presented to Yerba Buena, but 10, 12 years ago, maybe. And it's been a long time. I, I couldn't figure out when it was, and maybe, um, but it's a pleasure to see you all again. So well, I hope we get you back again Thanks. soon, David. Really appreciate you. Being okay. Here. All right. Take care. Bye bye, everybody. Bye -bye.